Good afternoon, doctors. Uh, to get started, uh, I would request uh, Dr. Viviana Cho to start uh, with her session. Over to you, ma'am. The chair presenter, Song Jun Ki, please. Yeah. Okay. Now it's time to get started. I'm Professor Song Jun Kim from Seoul National University, Korea. I'm also the Secretary General of Korean Ophthalmological Society, KOS. It's an honor to me and KOS to participate in this annual conference of All India Ophthalmology Society. I hope this session will serve as an opportunity to confirm friendship and cooperation between AIOS and KOS. In this session, Six outstanding researchers from Korea will present on the ocular imaging. I and my friend, Professor Gyeongjik Chue from Suncheonhyang University are going to introduce them. Questions or comments from audience will be discussed shortly after all the presentation. Now, the first speaker is Dr. Won Gyeong Jo. Uh, her topic is surgical approach to orbital tumors. Dr. Zhou, please. Could you please show us the presentation? Which one, is please. Oh. Which one talks up? Viviana Cho, please. Viviana Cho. We are waiting for the first presentation. Okay. Hello everyone. I'm Viviana Cho from Catholic University of Korea. I'm happy to have a chance to have a presentation at AIOC 2021 in conjunction with KOS. I'd like to thank you for having us and I hope this session would contribute to exchange our knowledge and solidify our mutual friendship. My topic is surgical approach to orbital tumors. Orbit contains a complex array of closely juxtaposed anatomical structures, posteriorly projects into the cranial compartment, anteriorly onto the face and forehead, mutually contribute to visual function. Orbital bones are composed of seven bones. For surgery, we should know where the tumor located and which side we are going to approach. Orbit can be divided into several zones like this figure. And surgical incision can be made along double fold line, medial canthus, subciliary or brow, fornix, and lateral canthus. Especially for medially located tumor, anterior and posterior mesmoid artery can be major source of bleeding, so a surgeon should take extreme caution. I'm going to show four cases which were operated, operated through four different surgical approach, superior, inferior, medial with eyelid vertical incision, and lateral orbital tomy. My first case is dermoid cyst. Dermoid cyst or epidermoid cyst are one of choristoma, the most common orbital tumors found in children. Most common site is zygomatical frontal suture line, more often found at superotemporal area than supranasal area. A 24-month-old girl showed a palpable movable mass on her 
supertemporal orbit. CD scan revealed well-defined ground mass above the zygomatic frontal suture line, usually bone erosion concurrent because of slow growth. Superior orbital tomy was performed through sub-brow incision, and the mass was completely excised. Here is the pre- and post-op photos. My second case is carvenous hemangioma, which was completely excised through inferior approach. Carvenous hemangioma is the most common orbital tumors found in adults. It affects women more often in comparison with men at a 2 to 1 ratio. Patients complained of insidious onset of penis proptosis. The most common location is intraconal area. Let's take a look at both intraconal and extraconal surgical approach. I prepared my own medially located intraconal mass case for the next. I'd like to introduce a approach for temporally located intraconal mass from Dr. Kikawa's and Dr. Kwon's book. Inferior rectus bridal suture was made for proper traction, and lateral counter to me was made for widening the surgical field. Transconjunctival incision below inferior tarsus was made with bobby. Dissection continues, and arcus marginalis along the inferior lateral orbital rim is then exposed. Periosteum is opened with number 12 blade. After the dissection, anterior face of the orbital mass was found. The mass was totally excised with cryoproof. Here is my own case. A 70-year-old male came to the clinic for per prolapsed palpable mass. Through palpebra conjunctiva, a bluish round elevated mass was visible and CD shows oval-shaped mass at inferonasal extraconal space. Inferior orbital tomy was made through skin incision above the mass location, and the mass was completely excised. These are pre- and post-op photos. The third case is Shuvanomas which was removed through medial lower elite vertical incision with endoscope assistance. The vestibulococlear nerve and the trigeminal nerves are the most common site of origin for orbital shivanomas, but it can occur at sensory, motor, and sympathetic nerve. These lesions are diagnosed in the mean age being 50 years and it grows slowly. Although there is no diagnostic neurological features. Orbital CD frequently reveals a smooth, elongated circumscribed intracoronal or extracoronal mass. Expansion of superior orbital fissure may also be seen. Shuvanomas give low signal intensity on T1 weighted images and higher intensity signal on T2 weighted images in non contrast MRI. A 77-year-old female visited our clinic for the left eye proptosis with double vision. Her left eye visual acuity was decreased to 0.3 and showed media gaze limitation. Exophthalmometer showed 3 mm proptosis on her left eye. Here is her CT scan. There is a considerable size of smooth, elongated, well circumscribed intracoronal mass between the optic nerve and medial rectus. Because the mass was located at inferior medial intracoronal space, I decided to approach to the mass through lower eyelid vertical incision with endoscope assistance to secure enough and safe surgical field. The mess was anchored tightly by fibrous band, as you can see in the photo left below. 
About 2.5 cm sized orbital tumors was completely excised. However, the meter gaze limitation did not recover. My last case is a pleomorphic adenoma, which was performed through lateral orbitotomy. Pleomorphic adenoma is the most frequent neoplasm of the lacrimal gland. The typical clinical presentation of pleomorphic adenoma is an insidious onset of painless proptosis with inferonasal displacement of the globe and lateral upper lid fullness. Duration of symptoms may range from one month to more than five years. The orbital lobe of the lacrimal gland is generally affected. A 63-year-old male visited our clinic complaining of proptosis of the left eye. As I mentioned above, his left eyeball is displaced inferonasally and the lateral upper lid shows fullness. On CD or MRI, Lacrimal gland pleomorphic adenoma presents as a round to over where circumscribed lesion. Pleomorphic adenoma may have variable attenuation because of uh, disparate composition of cellularity within the individual tumor. High cellularity regions are homogeneous, whereas less cellular areas tend to show non-homogeneous attenuation as a result of mesenchymal stroma, cystic degeneration, necrosis, or serous or mucus collection. Calcifications and anterior extension of the mass beyond the orbital rim are rare. The same features are found on MRI, since small tumors with a compact epithelial component appears as relatively homogeneous legends of the intermediate signal intensity on T1-weighted images and appear as high signal intensity on T2-weighted images, whereas large tumors with abundant mesenchymal component, hemorrhage, or necrosis exhibit heterogeneous signal intensity on T1 and T2-weighted images. Lateral orbitotomy was planned for the unblocked tumor excision. There are two options for orbital incision, and I choose lateral counter horizontal incision, shown as B. The left upper photo is before the surgery, you can compare the patient's proptosis of the both eyes. And the incision line was shown in the right upper photo. Above the frontal zygomatic suture line and parallel to the floor of the orbit, orbitotomy was made for the lateral orbital rim remover. Here is a video that the mass extraction was performed through cryo extraction. These CD scans are taken after the operation. You can see the lateral orbital rim was replaced properly and the pleomorphic adenoma was completely excised. There are pre and post op photos of patients. There are no surgical complications so far. Here is my take home message a knowledge of exact anatomy and thorough understanding of relations between bones, arteries, and nerves can result in the best surgical outcome. Thank you for listening. Uh, sorry, okay. sorry, you are on mute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Viviana Wang Gyeongjo. And the next speaker is Dr. Gyeongjin Cho. He is from Hanguk University. Yeah. The topic is imaging techniques in the diagnosis of dry eye syndrome. Dr. Jo, please. Okay, let's play the clip, please. Hello, my name is Joo Kyung Jin from Dangun University in South Korea. 
it is an honor to be able to present this at the 79th All India Ophthalmological Society Conference. Hughes to defines dry eye syndrome as follows. Dry eye is a multifactorial disease of the ocular surface characterized by a lack of homeostasis of the tear film that results in symptoms of discomfort, visual disturbance, or ocular surface signs. For the diagnosis of dry eye syndrome, symptoms are surveyed and homeostasis marker tests such as tear back of time, tear osmolarity, and ocular surface staining are performed. And then the evaporative type or the aqueous deficiency type is classified according to the presence of MGD and the tear meniscus height. Various imaging tests are performed to diagnose and classify dry eye syndrome. Examples include many such as a keratography or OCT, NI beauty, somography, mavograph, and interferometry test. First, in the diagnosis of aqueous deficient dry eye, there is an imaging technique for the tear secretion. Tear meniscus height can be measured using keratography or OCT image as shown in the picture. In this study, using anterior segment to swap source OCT, the tear meniscus height was measured and analyzed. And the cutoff value for the diagnosis of dry eye syndrome was measured, presented. Most images are taken one second after blink while blinking spontaneously during the examination. Induced to the tear meniscus height value for the diagnosis of aqueous deficient dry eyes is 0.2 mm. Spectrally sourced tear meniscus height measurements were more reliable than the new keratograph data. Agreement between the devices was poor. A tear evaporative test is required for the evaporative dry eye diagnosis. While doctors can visually measure tear wake of time using fluorescein, specular reflection images can be used to measure non-invasive tear break of time. An eye beauty results in longer measured value of time to wake up than stability assessment techniques involving fluorescence instead of installation. A method of measuring the stability of the tear film by projecting a grid pattern composed of gradual straight lines and circles onto the cornea using a circular projection device. The time when distortion appears on the projected line was defined as the tear film destruction time. A 46-year-old female patient presented with complaints of ocular discomfort and curing. The tear meniscus height is 0.3 mm and the non-invasive tear break of time is 3 seconds. So it can be diagnosed with an evaporative type dry eye. The cooling rate of the ocular surface is faster in individuals with dry eye disease than in normal eyes, which is measured to be as a result of a greater rate of tear film evaporation. Next. We will talk about imaging techniques in diagnosing MGD. MGD is a monomalarity in the lipid component of the test due to anatomical and functional abnormalities of the malignant gland. This may result in alteration of the tear film, symptom of eye irritation, clinical apparent inflammation and ocular surface disease. 
Maybe I'm going to drop out is observed on maple rapid MGD patient. The interval perimetry principle can be used to measure the lipid layer thickness in tears. Can MGD be diagnosed by lipid layer thickness alone? In tears, thickness is important for lipid layer, but lipid characteristics and dynamics are also very important. In addition, care must be taken to avoid the contamination of lipids in tears during the examination. In this patient, tear circulation is normal in the Sherman test, but the lipid layer thickness is 43 nanometer in the right eye and 66 nanometer in the left eye. Mammography shows a severe dropout of mammary glands in both eyes. In this patient, geographical time and lipid layer thickness were decreased, but mammary gland dropout was not severe. When I squeezed the mammary gland, a toothpaste-like lipid came out. Even if there is no abnormality in the mammography, dry eye can occur due to abnormal lipid, like this. The problem is discrepancy between the lipid layer thickness value and the mammography or the clinical findings. In patients with MGD, if tear secretion is small as shown on the left, the lipid layer thickness may be measured relatively thick because the lipid does not spread well. As shown on the right, if there is a lot of tear secretion and spreads well, the lipid layer thickness can be measured thinly. This patient has a right eye conjunctivitis, so the lipid layer may be thick. However, this is an abnormal lipid layer. This patient has severely reduced lipid layer in both eyes. If you look here, this patient doesn't close his eyes very well. This makes dry eye. The above test methods can be used to diagnose and classify MGD and determine treatment method. Let's talk about imaging techniques on ocular surface. The part that comes into contact with the cornea is called the lid wiper, and the stand area is called the lid wiper epithelial pass. Confocal microscopy can be used to image the cornea lobe and the conjunctival epithelium. Conjunctival injection may also be an important sign in dry eye syndrome. Thank you. Thank you, Gyeongjin Cho. The third speaker is Dr. Jiung Lee from Busan University. The title of the presentation is Anterior Segment of Optical Coherence Tomography Imaging of Filtering Blebs After Trabeculectomy with Amniotic Membrane Transplantation. Dr. Lee, please. Thank you for inviting me to AI Oasis Symposium. Today, I would like to talk about anterior segment optical coherence tomography imaging of filtering blabs after trabeculectomy with amniotic membrane transplantation in patients with primary open angle glaucoma. Trabeculectomy is still gold standard for glaucoma filtering surgery. However, it has complications associated with mitomycin C and 5-FU. 
Previous studies of trabeculectomy with M90 membrane transplantation reported that it is effective in IOP control with less complication. Our group reported that trabeculectomy with AMT in Korean patient with POAG has comparable success rate at one year after surgery. However, a vascular cystic blood was not observed in the AMT group while eight eyes in the control group has a vascular cystic blood. The purpose of this study was to analyze the anterior segment optical coherence tomography-based intraoblet parameters associated with long-term intraocular pressure control in patients who underwent trabeculectomy with or without m membrane transplantation and cryopreserved M90 membrane with stromal cyda was used in the surgery. This was retrospective comparative study with 128 eyes of 107 patients. 43 eyes of 38 patients were included in trabeculectomy with mitomycin C group and 85 eyes of 69 patients were included in trabeculectomy with mitomycin C and AMT group. All patients had follow-up more than 12 months. And success criteria at ASOCT examination was IOP less than equal to 18 mm of mercury and IOP reduction more than 20% without glaucoma medication. Spectral domain spectralis OCT was used in this study. When it comes to intraoblab structural parameter, radial and tangential scans were measured at the maximum height and extent of the blab, and then mean values were calculated. Blab height, blab wall thickness, internal fluid space height, microcyst formation, stripping phenomenon, and lake under scleral flap and fluid field space score and stripping layer thickness were measured. There was no significant difference in demographics and clinical characteristics between two groups except OCT test interval. When you look at intraoblab parameters in the control group, we can see that blab height, blab wall thickness, stripping layer thickness, stripping and blood work ratio were greater in successful group than in unsuccessful group. And microcyst formation and stripping phenomena were more frequent in successful group. Whereas blood work reflectivity is greater in unsuccessful group and encapsulated blood was more frequent in unsuccessful group. When we look at intraoblab parameters in the AM2 group, we can see that blab height, blab wall thickness, stripping layer thickness, stripping and blab wall ratio. Fluid space area, fluid field space score were greater in successful group. And microcyst formation, stripping phenomenon, and lake under sclera flap were more frequent in successful group whereas blood wall reflectivity was greater in unsuccessful group and encapsulated blood was more frequent in unsuccessful group. When we compare intra-blood parameters between two successful groups, we can see that blood height, blood wall thickness, stripping layer thickness, stripping blood wall ratio were greater in control group and stripping phenomena was more frequent in control group, whereas internal fluid space height, fluid space area, and fluid field space score were greater in AMT group. We performed multiple logistic regression analysis to evaluate which variables are associated with success of trabeculectomy in control group. The result showed that 
higher black wall reflectivity had negative impact on good IOP control. The result of multiple logistic regression analysis in AMT group showed that higher black wall reflectivity still had negative impact on good IOP control, well as greater fluid field space score and microcyst formation were associated with good IOP control. This slide shows you right and left eye of same patient who received the trabeculectomy in both eyes. Right eye received trabeculectomy combined with AMT and left eye received trabeculectomy alone in other clinic. ASOCT shows that supraoscleral space extended posteriorly behind the field of view after trabeculectomy with AMT, whereas multiple fluid collection covered by a thin layer of conjunctiva was found in the left eye after trabeculectomy alone. This is another case of different intraoblast structures of eyes in the same patient who received trabeculectomy with or without AMT. AS-OCT shows hyporefractive blood wall with microcyst, and suprasclera space extended beyond field of view. Although slit lamp blood photographic image of the left eye after trabeculectomy alone looks similar to that of the right eye, the anterior segment optical coherence tomography image of the left eye was quite different from that of the right eye. AS OCT image shows that hyperrefractive blood wall with prominent stripping phenomenon. AS-OCT image of the patient with good IOP control after trabeculectomy with AMT showed that fluid field space extended posteriorly beyond field of view. Whereas AS-OCT image of the patient with good IOP control after trabeculectomy alone showed that prominent stripping phenomenon in hyporefractive blood wall. In conclusion, we found that factors related to successful IOP control in both groups were high blood height thick and hyperreflective blood wall and microcyst and stripping of the blood. It suggested that transconjunctival pathway of outflow play a role in both groups. We also found that factors associated with successful IOP control in AMT group was the internal fluid space extending to our the conjunctival phonix, and it suggested that subconjunctival pathway of our flow play a role in AMT group. Thank you for listening. Hi. Could you change the monitor video clip? Okay. Hi, I'm Dr. Choi Gyeongsik. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to moderate this session with Professor Song Jun Kim. Let's move on to the next presentation. Next topic is secondary macro hole. And the speaker is Dr. Kim Min from Yonsei University. Dr. Kim, please.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Min Kim, and it is a great honor and pleasure to participate in this wonderful meeting. And I'd like to personally thank AIOC for their very kind invitation. Today, I'd like to speak about the formation of macular hole after vitrectomy, their clinical features, risk factors, and treatment strategies. These are my financial disclosures. Macular hole, as you all know, is formed as a result of interactions between various forces on the fovea, mainly from anterior posterior and tangential traction by the vitreous. And for the treatment of macular hole, surgery is usually performed to relieve these tractional components through vitrectomy with or without island peeling. But how do you explain the formation of macular hole even after vitrectomy? For example, this patient initially presented with a mac off retinal detachment and received vitrectomy, but still ended up developing full thickness macular hole. Secondary full thickness macular hole after vitrectomy is a rare surgical complication with a reported instance of up to 1.9% and its contributing factors to its development in the absence of intact vitreous is not well understood, and pathogenic mechanisms other than those for idiopathic macular hole may be involved. So this study was performed to investigate the clinical spectrum of a secondary macular hole that develops after vitrectomy and assess the treatment outcome, and to identify the risk factors that contribute to the development of secondary macular hole, and also determine the predictive factors for long-term visual prognosis. This was a retrospective case series, and the inclusion criteria is as follows. A total of 6,354 consecutive patients who underwent primary vitrectomy were initially screened, and those that developed a post-op secondary macular hole were eventually included in the study. And those patients who had undergone initial surgery for a macular hole were excluded from the study. 38 eyes of 37 patients were identified to have developed secondary macular hole out of total of 6,354 cases that underwent vitrectomy. This was an instance of 0.6%, and the mean age at the onset of macular hole development was 57.1 years old, and the median time to macular hole diagnosis after vitrectomy was 2.3 months, and the average axial length was 25.1 millimeters, and 48% of the patients had a longer axial length greater than 26 millimeters. And the most common primary diagnosis for the initial vitrectomy were retinogenous retinal detachment, followed by secondary aporetinal membrane and vitreous hemorrhage. There were also a few cases of idiopathic aporetinal membrane, lamella hole, some macular hemorrhage, and vitromacular traction syndrome coexisting pathology and imaging features prior to initial vitrectomy are as follow. Epiretinal membrane was detected on OCT in 58% and vitreous was also seen attached at fovea in 58% of them. Vitreous hemorrhage was noted in 29%, followed by retinoschisis in 13%, lamella macular hole in 11%, also, 8% of the patients had a past surgical history of mac off retinal detachment. Adjuvant surgical procedures performed in addition to vitrectomy for the initial diagnosis are as follows. Island peeling in 44% of the eyes, pneumatic tamponade in 42%, silicone oil injection in 32%, and sclerobuckle or encircling in 13% of the eyes. The average macular hole size on preoperative OCT was 544 microns. And the presence of epiretinal membrane on OCT was noted in 50% of the patients. And for the treatment of secondary macular hole, ILM peeling was performed in more than 80% of the patients. And if there were no ILMs remaining, uh, ILM transplantation was performed. And either silicone oil or a gas tamponade was performed. And the closure of macular hole was achieved 94% of the patients. At post-op 24 months, 
the average visual acuity was 20 over 86. And 47% of the patients improved at least three lines of visual acuity. The majority of the patients improved at least one line after macular hole closure. And the multivariable analysis of surgical and visual outcomes were performed. And the factors influencing a three-line visual loss by the most recent follow-up were uh, best corrective visual acuity at pre-op and post-op three months, as well as axial length greater than 28 millimeters. And the factors influencing the need for multiple surgeries for macular hole closure were having a history of macula off retinal detachment. And macular hole size or the presence of perioperative epiretinal membrane were only significant in the univariate analysis. This is the largest case series of secondary macular hole published so far. And we speculate that the estrogenic traction created during the induction of PVD, epiretinal membrane removal, or the island peeling, or the presence of residual recurrent epiretinal membrane may be involved in the development of the secondary macular hole. And previous studies consistently showed that there was a trend of macular hole formation after repair of mac off retinal detachment, and also the association of secondary macular hole with high myopia has also been found in previous studies. In conclusion, secondary macular hole occurs rarely with an incidence of 0.6% at 2.3 months after vitrectomy in our case series. And it occurred most commonly after vitrectomy for retinal detachment. And those patients with an axial length greater than 28 millimeters may have limited visual prognosis after vitrectomy for macular hole closure. And those with a history of mac off retinal detachment may require multiple surgeries for secondary macular hole closure. So then, what are some of the treatment options that we have for closing macular hole, even after the vitreous and ILM are already removed? Well, we can use the following surgical options to try to close the secondary macular hole. We can consider performing autologous ILM free flaps, amniotic membranes, lens capsules, autologous scleral flap, or even autologous retinal free flaps. Well, these surgical options may sound quite easy to perform, but uh, for beginning retinal surgeons or surgeons with not so much experience in dealing with these surgically challenging situations, it may not be so easy. So I'd like to introduce a modified simple technique for ILM free flap transplantation and macular hole surgery. I call this technique the peel PFCL peel technique. This will help you overcome some of the surgical difficulties while improving manipulation and retention of the ILM free flaps during macular hole surgery. The PLPF seal peel technique for ILM free flaps in recurrent or persistent macular holes. A woman in her mid 60s presented with worsening central vision in her right eye. Her BCVA was 20 over 100. Fundus examination and OCT showed a very large, full thickness macular hole. She had a history of attempted macular hole repair at another center nearly two years ago. The provided OCT images showed that the initial surgery failed and her macular hole remained persistent. She agreed to undergo additional surgery at our center using our modified island free flap transplantation technique. Autologous island free flaps are comparatively easy to obtain but the technique is surgically and technically challenging owing to the difficulty in stabilizing and manipulating the thin flaps. PFCL or viscoelastic assisting techniques have been reported, but the techniques as currently described remain demanding. Injection prior to peeling will result in difficulty in creating the flap itself. And in cases when injection is done after flap creation, there is high risk of spontaneous flap loss or the flap may refuse to go into the PFCL bubble and float on the bubble's surface. Thus, we introduce the peel PFCL peel technique. A small PFCL bubble is injected over the fovea to protect the exposed RPE. Afterwards, ILM is stained using ICG dye.
We can then identify the remaining ILM and plan for free flaps. The planned ILM flaps are first partially peeled to create edges that can later be easily grasped. This first peel is important as it enables regrasping even if the edges were later to be flattened under PFCL. Then additional PFCL is injected so that the entire posterior pole and all planned flaps are fully covered. the previously peeled ILM flap edges can then be easily visualized and grasped under the PFCL without having to then create the ILM flaps under the influence of heavy liquids. ILM free flaps can be efficiently completed and placed within the macular hole. The high density and high interfacial tension of PFCL stabilizes the ILM free flap once it is released. And enables multiple regrasping of ILM flaps for proper placement within the macular hole if necessary. PFCL bubble, there is no need to fear the flaps floating away and flittering out of view. Gentle massaging of the macular hole margins may improve outcomes and retention of ILM flaps. Fluid air exchange is first performed, followed by careful and deliberate PFCL air exchange. While performing fluid air exchange, care must be taken to prevent dislodging of the ILM flap by carefully placing the extrusion tip away from the macular hole. The posterior pole can be carefully rinsed with balanced salt solution to ensure that PFCL is fully removed. At post-op week 1, we can confirm on OCT that the macular hole was successfully closed. Okay, so this thanks. modified simple technique for ILM free flap is an easy to perform, efficient variant sequence that can easily create and stabilize the island free flap for proper placement within the macular hole. We we'll believe that this technique can be utilized readily even for surgeons with little experience in dealing with recurrent or persistent macular hole. Thank you for your attention and once again I'd like to express my gratitude for the wonderful invitation to this meeting. I hope to personally meet each and every one of you in the near future meeting. Until then, take care and goodbye. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Okay, next speaker is Dr. An Ji Yoon from Seoul National University. She will talk to us about retinal imaging in neurodegenerative disease. Dr. Han, please. Good afternoon, everyone. 
My name is Ji Yunan, and it is a great honor for me to present at the 2021 AIOC KOS Joint Symposium. Today, I will be talking about retinal imaging in neurodegenerative diseases. Before my talk, I will briefly introduce myself. I work as an associate professor at Porame Medical Center, an affiliate hospital of Seoul National University. My research interests include retinal imaging in neurodegenerative diseases, namely Parkinson's disease, as well as ocular genetics of AMD and diabetic retinopathy. If you have any questions about my talk today, please feel free to email me at this address. Parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder of the CNS and the second most common cause of dementia following Alzheimer's disease. The histopathological hallmark of PD is the death of dopaminergic neurons within the substantia nigra, which results in the typical bradykinesia, rigidity, and tremor seen in these patients. Recently, there has been advanced understanding of the non motor symptoms such as hip osmia, sleep disruption, depression, and constipation, which initiate prior to the onset of motor symptoms, and heightened hope that if early diagnosis is possible in this prodromal stage, treatments to modulate the disease course may be possible. Non-motor symptoms also include visual symptoms such as impaired color vision and visual hallucinations with dopaminergic loss within the retina and occipital cortex implicated as the possible causal mechanism. There has been numerous OCT studies trying to understand the pathophysiology underlying the visual symptoms common in Parkinson's disease patients. Most of the initial studies looked at peripapillary RNFL thickness. And as you can see on this forest plot of a meta-analysis study, there is decrease of average RNFL thickness in PD patients. As for studies looking at changes in the macula, most studies have used different OCT machines and analysis protocols with too few patients and hence have failed to reach a consensus on whether there is or isn't any structural retinal change. Our group has also looked at retinal changes in Parkinson's disease, and this was one of our earliest studies. We focused on visual hallucinations, which is a common symptom in both non-demented and demented PD patients. We looked at the following five points in the macula, and segmented the retina into single layers and compared the thickness between PD control, PD with visual hallucination, and those with both dementia and hallucination, and found significant RNFL thinning in those with visual hallucination and dementia. Next, we wanted to find out if retinal changes were present in early stage patients who were drug naive. A few differentiating points for this study were that since we only included early-stage patients who were drug-free, we could gather a homogeneous patient group without any drug effect. We also used the automatic single-layer segmentation software within the Spectralis viewer and used a smaller 3.45 mm ETDRS circle. Microperimetry was used to assess function anatomic correlation and brain dopamine transporter image was done using a PET MRI to correlate retinal changes with those occurring in the brain. Our analysis showed the presence of retinal thinning, especially in the inner temporal and inferior sectors. And such structural changes correlated with the Hoenya scale, which is a clinical indicator of PD severity. The higher the score, the more severe the degree of neurodegeneration. And as you can see, the significant negative correlation shows that the thinner the retina, the higher the Hoenya scale. Analysis with the dopamine transporter image also showed significant correlation between dopamine uptake decrease and retinal thinning. 
Hence, this study shows that retinal structural change is present even in the early stages of PD and correlates with clinical severity as well as dopaminergic degeneration within the brain, implying that retinal imaging may be used as a biomarker in Parkinson's disease. Next, we looked at REM sleep behavior disorder in which normal muscle atonia during REM sleep is lost. It may be idiopathic or secondary and often precedes the development of Parkinson's disease with reported conversion rates between 30 to 65%. We looked at whole retinal thickness and the ganglion cell complex within the same 3.45 millimeter ETDRS circle olfactory function, and brain dopamine transporter image. Retinal thinning was evident in the inner and temporal sectors, and when we compared the control, RBD, and PD groups, we could see a sequential decrease of retinal thickness. Olfactory function, which was decreased in RBD patients, showed significant correlations with GTC thickness, and GTC thickness correlated with dopamine loss in the caudate and putamen. A recent study looked at cell density of dopamine-producing amacrine cells in cadaver eyes and found a profound reduction in PD compared to controls. Looking closely at the perifoveal density in PD eyes, one can see that there is more decrease in the temporal and inferior areas, which coincides with the results of our study. This is a magnified section of the perifovia with an additional overlay of the 3.45 mm ETDRS circle. We also showed the average thickness in color codes to indicate the areas of more profound retinal thickness decrease. PD is a progressive neurodegenerative disease which usually start with non-motor symptoms. The fact that our studies show the presence of retinal changes even in RBD, which is thought to be a prodromal stage of PD, shows that retinal imaging may be used as a biomarker in PD and possibly enable early diagnosis and timely intervention to ultimately modulate the course of the disease. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Dr. Tan. Let's move on to the last presentation. Okay, next presenter is Dr. Shin Yong Un from Hanyang University. And his talk is effect of hemodialysis on ocular structure. Dr. Shin, please. Thank you so much, speakers, for this wonderful session. And now, uh, with this note, we will conclude the session for today. Thank you so much.